Welcome to Power Lunch. I am so excited to have Brandy Blackwell with us today, VP of Marketing at Another Broken Egg Cafe, former executive at Jimmy John's, Duncan, Michael Lister, Tijuana Flats, a big fan of Michael Jordan, and Britney Spears as well. We'll talk about a little bit about everything that's happening there. One of Lunchbox's top 30 women in food for 2024, voted by the community, FSR's rising stars for top 20 under 40. This is going to be a long intro, guys. Everyone, please hold your breath. Leaders on the road to 100 for ABEC, Pizza Connoisseur, FSR's next-gen casual and woman and restaurant leadership council member, restaurant marketer superstar, Brandy Blackwell. Thank you so much for having us. I'm exhausted from the intro. That was quite the intro. I think I need to update my bio. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me, Nabil. I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you for being here. If you want, we can chop that audio and you can just send it to people instead of giving them a business card. Just because this is a lot of stuff. Tube socks, uh, boy, about to pop the lunchbox. Yeah. Tube socks, uh, boy, about to pop the That's great. No, then I don't have to say it. We were talking a little bit about Mr. Don Fox. He was just here on the pod last week. And I was telling you, you're going right after him. And uh, you were saying a very fun story. I would love to just talk about that on camera. Sure. I have sort of been obsessed with Don Fox for a long time and not in a creepy way, but in a way where I have just kind of idolized him. I grew up in Florida and started my career with Tijuana Flats in the Orlando area and part of Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association. I would see him. He's a big uh, speaker on the circuit and obviously his firehouse movement. Always had a, a lot of respect for him and he ended up on a council, a similar council that I sit on, the National Restaurant Association. And I got the chance in a couple of years ago in, in Dallas to sit next to him at a barbecue dinner. And I took my opportunity to sit right next to him and have a conversation with him and introduce myself. And I, he was just one of the nicest humans. And so not only is he great at what he does, he's a good industry leader. And I just have nothing but respect for him. He's an industry legend. And I love that you guys are going right after each other. You have such an amazing career already. I hate when people say rising star, but you are such a superstar in our industry. You work for some iconic brands and now you're at Under Broken Egg. Is this what you wanted when you were like, let's say in college or high school? How do we get here? Is this plan? Is this an accident? Oh gosh, um, I'd love to say that I had it all planned out. I had none of this planned out. You know, in fact, I was an advertising major and, you know, similar to marketing. I knew what I didn't want to do, but I didn't know what I really wanted to do. And kind of fell in with the account executive uh, advertising side of things for not even a year. And, you know, that didn't really fill my cup up. So found the opportunity with Tijuana Flats and went over um, to be a marketing manager. And that was during a time of, you know, 2000 seven, eight, where it was very challenging to get a job, keep a job. But I fell into the Tijuana Flats world. I drank the Kool-Aid fast and I was there eight and a half years and, you know, just loved every aspect of food and even, even parts of the business outside of marketing, just fell in love with the industry. But the industry is really hard. It's a really tough industry and it's even tougher for, you know, women executives to, you know, get there. Did anyone mentor you? Who supported you on your journey? It's 80% always you, but who were the 20% who said, let me guide you here and there. I had a, a boss at Tijuana Flats that she's still one of my very close friends and mentors. And she really threw me into the fire quite a bit. I'll tell you, you know, she would, there would be a panel that she was going to speak on in a couple days and said, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to make it. I'm going to send you. And I would, you know, I'd be terrified and, and I'd have to prepare for it. And I would like dread it. And then, you know, everything I did or every uncomfortable situation that that she put me in or challenged you with, you know, I, I, I always said yes. I just said yes to everything and sat on, you know, she threw some boards, we divided, you know, conquered and I joined some of the community boards and just really built a network out of that. And then start, saw the value of networking and just meeting people and learning constantly. I just wanted to like learn constantly. Um, so she was one of them, you know, and then, you know, I worked under a, another really um, special female, Stephanie, who's over, at, um, she's over at MasterCard now. And she just very strong female led digital Duncan and then Inspire. And she was just like a boss to work for. So, and I say that a boss and a boss as a woman, our CEO is my supervisor boss twice over. So I moved to Atlanta to work under him, McAllister's Deli and the off-premise landscape, and then came full circle to work with him again a couple of years ago at another book and I jumped at the chance. So all three of those people have stayed mentors. I call them, I text them, you know, just about random questions all the time. I love it. I love it. I, I was talking to a mentee of mine and I was telling them that I learn a lot from her as well. As I'm mentoring her, I'm learning also a lot in the process. Like what is one thing you're like, oh, I was able to also help them because of this awesome relationship we have. 
well, my, my first class, I taught her all sorts of slang lingo that the younger kids at the time knew. And so we, we got many laughs out of the words she didn't know that our group knew and we continued to use. And there's a lot of innuendos at Tijuana Flats, as you can imagine, that were brought up. So that was kind of fun. But, you know, also the off-premise side, I spent a lot of time in there and I kind of was very early to that space, which I know you know back and forth. And so, you know, in 2017, as kind of the first off-premise leader in focus brands or now go-to brands in the building, you know, I had to kind of learn a lot of that on my own. And then I was able to take that to Duncan and have this unique role where I was in SME and this, that space and that part of the digital business that was brand new for Duncan at the time, brand new for McAllister's prior. And so I feel like I was able to kind of bring that unique niche experience to not only the brands, but to my leaders and have trust in my experience in that space. I mean, that's so interesting because I'm a former marketer as well at a burger joint. And I moved from marketing to starting this company that was focused on off-premise. And you did the same thing. You were the subject matter expert. Your domain was marketing. But I think marketing is where we can attack or we can go ahead and actually grow first party revenue from, right? Because of all the special skills you've picked up in marketing. I feel like that's the best place it can come from. I completely agree with you. And I think, you know, you asked about my plan or my path. (laughs) You know, this off-premise thing was brand new. I said, oh, you know, I've done a lot of the bits and pieces of launching Uber Eats or whoever it might be and revamping catering and launching online ordering but how that it all operates together as seamless as possible and the adoption of playing in the third party space, but how do you still focus on your first party channels and what does that strategy look like? It's so much bigger than just, you know, launching these platforms. How does it all work together? And I think that, and then a lot of the technical side of things, I did the tablets to the POS integration life and, you know, reconciling books. So when I kind of leaned into all aspects of the business and really worked with a a massive cross-functional team to understand the POS integrations a little bit better to understand what API meant. It's really relatively new to, to most marketers and most marketers don't fully understand a lot of the technical landscape. So I made, you know, myself best friends with IT and operations and learned as much as I could from both of those sides too throughout this process, which has really helped me in the marketing landscape. I think if there's one advice I would give to our marketing leaders out there is to listen to this part of the conversation that you're sharing, which is because you know the details, they invite you into the tent as well. A lot of times the marketers don't know the details, don't know the technical details and don't want to as well. And there's such a disconnect, but marketing is like putting tech in there, implementing it is easy. Like putting lunchbox somewhere is easy, but the rest of it is what marketing can do with it. And I think that relationship between the two is so special. And I think you have uh, cracked it. Well, I'm still working on it, but I think that, you know, when you look at like, we talk a lot about like data and the data we're getting and, you know, the data we don't get from third parties sometimes, you know, really taking that data and being able to start to use it effectively. And, you know, I always say, I don't want to be in a brand that's first to it, you know, to use it and and I don't want to be last. Right. And I think that's a fair place to be in regards to, you know, also in a franchisee model. I mean, I've worked in quite a few and Duncan was hundred percent franchised that Every penny matters and every order that fails in a POS system or every integration that, you know, helps to make the business more profitable. All of that is, you know, so critical to a franchisee and their bottom line. And so understanding it and at least being able to relate and um, have those conversations with your owners, it's critical to your success and rolling anything out as a marketer and trust your operators and franchisee system. Love it. Brandy, you were voted recently by your peers, by your friends, by the community as the top 30 women in food for 2024. First of all, how did, how did that feel? Was it, did it feel I good? Was surprised. Was it- I was completely surprised. I know. I mean, I, I, I was, it was one of those very like kind of shocking moments. I don't seek that attention of any sort. So when I'm surprised about something, it feels that much more rewarding because it was something that nobody sent out a link to ask to vote for me or anything. So I was honored. And the other thing that I was shocked by is some of the the women that were on that list. I, I knew quite a few of them from you know, the larger list to the smaller one. And like I said this recently, but just like sitting next to Karen Stutz on that list, like I love her. I've known her for years now and again, admired from afar and then became even a a mentor and and a little bit of an icon to me. I just think she's fabulous and she knows all sides of the business and as a woman that like makes you in this industry, I think completely powerful. 
Iconic is the best way to describe her. <laughs> and she's just so thoughtful. You know, she joined our food tech council. One of the first questions she asked me was, what is your intention? And I said, whoa, like, it's an important question, but you don't get asked so plainly, so simply, so clearly. And I said, well, number two is to make money. Absolutely. But number one is, you know, I think we have a good chance of, at being a second mover in the space. Like, you know, let's say Toast was to a lot of companies or even Facebook is a second mover, right? Now they're not the most innovative company in the world, but they were a second mover. We have the opportunity to be a second mover and make the industry a bit better and be restaurant people who build this company or restaurant marketer who build this company. So she said, okay, I like it, I'll join. But she really cares about what is it you want to accomplish and do I want to be a part of that journey and mentor you on that journey? You know, when I look at my team in, in marketing, I asked them all to read the book, um, Simon Sinek's- Why? The why, yeah, you, you know what I was gonna say. I kind of challenged that thought process when we're delivering something to a, the operators or franchisee community, like, why are we doing this? Like, what is the benefit to them? And sometimes the why is because it's time and technology is, you know, you gotta step it up. There's still, it's not always a perfect monetary benefit, but I try to kind of, if you get it down to the basic level, there's always generally a monetary benefit in our business. There, there is a benefit to the guest that is, and you, you know, you need to deliver on that or whether that's convenience, value, their time, whatever it is that you're seeking, you, sharing that why and understanding that why helps kind of bring you back to the core of the focus. She does things with intention. So I think that's a perfect example of somebody who values her time also to only give it to something that, you know, the intention matches what she believes in. Absolutely. And I love that you give that to your book. The book I give to my team, that's definitely under rotation. The one we share is Hard Things About Hard Things. Yeah. That's one of the books we share because tech is now under a lot of stress. And that book is all about, you know, how do you survive the dot-com bubble and, you know, some, some of those things. So that's one of the books we share. Candidly, it's one of the biggest challenges, not only because it's technology, but managing still the, the load of technology and implementing it, but also the, the fees that come with it. And there's only so many things you can have that hit, you know, a, a franchisee's p &L that, you know, that they're willing to, to adopt. And then, you know, just adoption with team members in the cafes also. It's important that it's really well thought out and strategically implemented. Yeah. How about we do some light ones? Uh, you're a Britney fan. Is this true? Is the rumor true? Am I making this up? I am a huge Britney Spears fan. I kind of grew up with her. You know, she was my teenage fixation. Social media has not served her well lately. Um, I just want to ask you, are we supporting the Justin Timberlake comeback or are we anti-JT comeback? That's oh, my... no, you got a JT comeback. I mean, come on. I, I missed his music and just, you know, <laughs> dance moves. He doesn't skip a beat. Yeah. Well, listen, he's in, I think he's performing in Vegas, if I'm not making this up. So uh, we got to get you tickets. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to work that yeah. into a trip. One of the conferences that's out there, one too. Of the, one of the conferences. Uh, are you going to RLC? You know, no, I am not. We have some prior brand commitments during the month, but I won't be at RLC. Okay. All right. Lucky. They make me go to all of them. I, I like <laughs> I, will I, be at, I will be at Meg. I will be okay. at Meg in, in okay. um, May, and I am part of that steering committee. So that's right before the National Restaurant Association show. That's all marketing executives. Um, so really hyper in the restaurant industry. Um, so, you know, if any interest is there, I'm happy to share more information about that too. Please do. I'd love to. I I've actually never been to Meg and I've been told re repeatedly that I should be there. Uh, not, I should be there. Like I should definitely go there. I think it was about my eighth year going. Um, wow. so I was just personally a big fan before I joined the steering committee a couple of years ago. I, it's just a good, it's a great group of people and, and it's just a, a really fun, intimate setting, very lighthearted and a lot of networking. It's great. What is one of the skills you leverage? One of the skills you have you leverage that is not on the job description of a marketing leader, but you are using it every day. Like it's, it's just like something you have to use, but, but people don't realize that it is part of your job description. I think, well, you know, what pops into my mind is just EQ is emotional intelligence. <laughs> That's another book I share because sometimes every decision, there are gut decisions and there are just things feel right sometimes. And sometimes those are the best decisions that I've made. So, you know, I think critical decision making at any level is part of a, a skill that not only one, you have to, you should be empowered to make and empower your teams to make, but the lack of being able to make a decision or to think that when something doesn't feel right, maybe it's not and vice versa is part of, I think, a great leader because everything doesn't always have a number or a perfect clear answer. 
I would just say that critical thinking, decision making, and being solution oriented. Anytime my team members come to me with a problem, I say, okay, we got like one minute to vent, two minutes, go ahead. But like, what do you think the solution is? Or what are a couple solutions to the problem? Because we kind of get in these spirals of being negative and that's really damaging to, and you don't even realize it's happening. So, so all of that to me is critical to being a good leader and also just to growth in your career. Got it. If we can stay on the topic of leadership for a little bit longer, how have you changed as a leader? Like let's say a decade ago to today, like what's similar still? What's still true about you and what has changed? So I've been able to see so many different dynamics in the brands that I've worked in from small to larger technology to like how a cross-functional team works together and supports each other. So I would say over the past 10 years, there's a couple things that's changed. One is I stopped trying to come across as being perfect and being not sharing personal things. And I realized that the second I started being, you know, more authentic, and that's a very vulnerable statement because, you know, I, I think younger I was, I had to pump up my chest a little bit more and, and I didn't want to be vulnerable. So I become a lot more vulnerable and a lot more honest with personal things or things that, you know, are impacting how I might show up a certain day. And I've encouraged my team members to be as honest as they want to be with me about that, but to take time off and just, you need a day. I never used to take time off at work every day and I never took my PTO. So I take PTO and I take all of my PTO every time. And I encourage my team to do that. So I'd say those, those are a couple of things, but just also I thought of the statement a while back and I kind of really believe in it. I think the difference between, you know, some often the difference between good and great is really simply confidence. So sometimes just show up and figure it out. And I don't want to say fake it till you make it, but show up and figure it out. And often those hardest times where you don't know what you're doing is where you grow as a person and a leader and where you end up, you know, thriving the most. That is so inspiring. And that is so true. Like that's how everything great was built, which is just Google it or just figure it out. Yeah, figure it out. And and that's the other thing is like even times where it's like I didn't dig for something on the server. I didn't go Google something, you know, or try to figure it out. So now. I teach the same thing to, especially to new team members is they'll ask, where is this? Where is this? Have you taken a look for it? <laughs> you know? And, and so you, you'd be surprised how much you can figure out when you just spend some time trying to learn and it's all out there, right? At your fingertips, there's so much out there to consume. In terms of off-premise, what is the next place tech companies need to focus on? What are we getting wrong or not investing enough from your point of view? You've been at these amazing large organizations. You're at one of the fastest growing breakfast place right now. What do we need to invest in more that you wish we did? I might take it a little bit of a different direction. I think that there's still this push and pull with third parties and there's a push and pull with being profitable, I think, for everybody. And so we're still in this space where every time we kind of have a partnership with a third party, the algorithms change, the terms change. So we agree on something, we don't necessarily love the setup, but then drivers need to make more money or can't raise their menu price as much as we were told we could. So there's a lot of things with pricing and I think things with terms that because of other pressures, whether that be stock, you know, public company now, and it wasn't drivers needing more money, insurance charges. It's making this still a very volatile environment that is really hard for as a marketer or a brand leader to have to constantly deal with, honestly. It takes a lot of time. And then we have to go in and kind of change our setup or change how, or maybe even not work with that certain partner because we're, we're frustrated. So I think there's just, a normalization that needs to happen where everybody kind of says, okay, we agree and don't change it this time because it's, um, it's tough. I mean, everybody fought third party delivery forever and you know, now it's the norm and we understand that, but it's still, it's still a challenge for brands and it's a competitive space. So I think technology that helps bring that all together and makes it more seamless at, from the guest experience. And then from the third party side, willingness to understand more of what a brand goes through and all the impact of the changes that could makes it challenging to operate day to day. We have so much on our plate and I just think it's just important that everybody plays nice in the sandbox and understands from both sides what we're trying to accomplish to your point. Like what is, what's our why, what are we doing? Because I, I think it's not a one size fits all approach. 
I really like that. Almost like a agreement, a peace treaty between yeah. all of us. Like peace <laughs> treaty sounds great. <laughs> yeah, like like a uh, what is it called? Like a a Paris treaty. Like hey, mm-hmm. this is let's all agree. And can we stop talking about it? Uh, At least for like ten years or something. You know what I mean? It's like you know. It's I think just, you're onto something, Brandy. I think you should lead this. You know, I think you should lead this every ten year. The Atlanta Accord, we'll call it, okay? And you lead this wherever you come up with ten-year-long agreements between delivery partners and restaurants. And whoever sells you a deal from any side of the equation should have worked on a restaurant brand or in a restaurant at some point and understand something about restaurant financials before they come to you and propose terms, because it's almost sometimes insane what what you hear. Absolutely. <laughs> any brands out there you respect and you admire from a from your marketing and branding lens? Oh yeah, there's tons. I mean, look at, of course, what Chipotle has done over the years with digital. I, that's a that's a no-brainer, right? They came back from, you know, I remember the days with the food safety issues, and and they really, you know, leaned it on digital and kind of went hard on that. So I think that they've done a lot of transformation in a really relatively short period of time. So you know, you can't help but look at that. I mean, there's always Chick Fil A, but there's plenty of you know smaller brands that are emerging that are great. Bar Taco is one of them. There's so many out there, and there's so much change. But digital adoption. Some of the ones that that really leaned in on that first and didn't have this big undertaking in the past few years to have to put all this in, kind of were winning. But just the personalization with the loyalty and an ability to know your customers. I mean, I, I'm going to go a little different direction. Sephora, I spent a lot of money at Sephora. And, I spent a lot of money at Sephora. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Yeah, this well, face and, is not. And now they're wrong. on Instacart and DoorDash, and I didn't have to leave the house to spend more money. Plus. You know tips and fees and so forth, but I got a mailer a couple days ago and from them, and I really don't even look at most of that. But I open it up and it says you know 20, 30 percent savings in this month, and it has six pictures of the products that I order all the time, and that's all that's on there. So they've taken my orders that I reorder and wow. said, don't miss these pics. Like they picked it for me, but they picked it for me because they're what I order. 90% of the time. And so I was like, oh my gosh. And yeah, and I and I've always thought they did a good job at kind of if you like this, you'll like this, you know, product recommenders, but you know, many people that are not in the restaurant industry are many brands, I mean, are really way ahead of us when it comes to knowing who the customers are and being there in real time with the right message and the right product recommender if I need a substitute of something. And I end up throwing so much in my cart just because they've shown me all these other things that I probably will like and I usually do. I think they're a great one to talk about like personalization and that movement towards really knowing your customers. I love that. You just described everything that is wrong with restaurant loyalty, you know, in a couple of sentences because like we just do so many set and forget it, like 10% off forever instead of like let me give this person what they actually want, right? Or like, let me listen to them. Let me actually, because the reason loyalty was created was, hey, we have too many restaurants. We don't no longer have a single restaurant. We no longer know our regulars. And we still want to treat at scale our customers like regulars. That was the idea. You know, it's almost like buying as a restaurant owner, buying someone a beer on the house because you're a regular or it's Friday night. <laughs> that, that's what we were supposed to do and scale. And that comes with a lot of emotion and loyalty. We got so much of it wrong with this 10% cash back, the standard issued money for free. Well, if I'm going to come to your restaurant anyways, and I candidly, I have mixed feelings about loyalty programs. I think they're often not profitable. And at the end of the day, they're a piece of it that's the feel good piece and the surprise and delight. But there's recognition and profitability and value is not always a discount. We don't discount at all at another broken egg. So our value is delivered in experience, the quality of the food, portion sizes, the elevated bar and top shelf, you know, liquor options and alcohol options. And so, you know, we're creating more of an experience and the value is to us is, you know, maybe you don't wait in line on the weekend or maybe you like the blueberry mimosa margarita. And so you end up getting, you know, that drink for free because we know you're buying habits. Like that's the type of value that you know, our checks are not $5. So it's, you know, this next gen casual world where, you know, somebody's paying 20 something dollars per person to come experience your, you know, to have brunch with you. Kind of knowing your customer, knowing that, that the chasing the discount is not always where we need to play and making it a model that truly can end up driving incremental revenue, driving check and driving ultimately bottom line margins and profit. 
Absolutely. I, I love that. And I love that you guys don't offer discounts. You might be one of the few companies out there. The norm is to offer all sorts of discounts and depreciate the value of the not only the food, but the brand and the experience. You know, there's certainly people in our competitive set. And during this time where macroeconomic challenges are not going away at the moment, we are feel confident in our products in our brand we believe that you're going to choose us and find value in, in different ways but because you want to dine with us and it doesn't have to be a discount that gets you in the door and so we we lean in on our the confidence and quality of our of what we you know serve what we provide last question the most important one you were on the cover of fsr magazine epic cover photo how much of it was because you're such a talented executive who's done amazing stuff? How much is it because of your fashion, which is also impeccable? Because uh, it could go either way for me, but I want to hear it directly from the source. Well, first off, I almost missed that photo shoot because I was flying into Orlando for it. So I was disheveled and <laughs> wanted it to be better than even it was. But truly, um, that's very funny. Thank you. But I will tell you that I have a great executive team, this been in marketing team, you know, that make me look a lot better. <laughs> Maybe they don't influence my fashion as much, but they influence my work and my success. And I am, wouldn't be successful without them. And the brand, I didn't, you know, build this brand from the ground up. I'm just, you know, the next phase of it as we, you know, reach a hundred, our hundredth opening wow. this month. So I'm just the next growth phase and just a piece of the pie. And I use that mentality to drive myself forward. And I think in my team, we all have an impact on this and I wouldn't be on the cover if it wasn't for them or the entire executive team and, and Paul's leadership. I love that, Brandy. I really, really appreciate you for spending some time with us. I know how busy you are. You're opening the 100th location now. What a huge milestone, uh, not just for the company, but for you as well. So I'm just excited. I'm excited to continue to see everything you're going to do. I'm excited for us to do another reunion podcast in a couple of years and like just continue to see your journey. So I'm a, a huge fan and uh, rooting for you. And congrats on your success and everything Lunchbox is doing too. Very awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks. me today. Thank you so much. To fly with me, tube socks, boy, about to pop the lunchbox, tube socks, boy.